Here we go. I am live. Hey, everybody. Glenn Hausman here of No Vacancy, now live podcast. Again, Glenn Hausman, your friendly uh, your friendly neighborhood Glenn here. And I'm very excited to have uh, you guys with me on board once again because we are going live. I think last week's experiment with going live or earlier this week's experiment went really, really well. And we're trying it again today. Uh, today, we're going to really try to um, focus on what you guys are looking for here. And we're going to be speaking with uh, Rick Garlic of uh, Mag and Hoop. I'm going to bring in right now. Boom. Oop. Where'd he go? There oh, he is. Yeah. Bam. I got him. How you doing you today? Do. All is good. Excellent. So, you know, we're, we've just gotten this started. We're waiting for real for people to come up um, and, and, and listen, but they'll be able to hear this part in terms of uh, when they we do the replay a little bit. So, Rick, I've known you for a little while now. You've been very focused on hospitality research, hospitality insight, and uh, now you've been with Magid for the last year and a half. Maybe tell us a little bit about what the company is all about before we get started so people can understand the, the, uh, the point of view that you're going to be coming from today. Well, absolutely. One of the things that we focus in on, mm -hmm. is not necessarily issues that people already have uh, researched and explored completely, but really trying to stay right. ahead of the curve and understand uh, what might be coming down the line that's for people to know about and understand. Right. So we do something that we call human-centered design, which is really trying to tap into insights that people may not even know they have, mm -hmm. but that people don't think about, but uh, yet are really important in the, the eyes and the minds of uh, right. whom we work with. So it's a really a cutting edge company. Very, very. Uh... Oh, and we lost Rick. Rick is having some uh, inter internet issues, but don't worry. He will be back in 30 seconds. So if this happens uh, again and again and again and again, we're just going to be a little bit uh, patient today. I want to thank you guys for uh, for tuning in over here. And I got to say, boom. The I'm man back. is back. Don't worry, Rick. I warned them. I warned them that uh, you are not having the best internet connection today. No, I'm, That's I'm what so you sorry. Get I was just, just talking about how cutting edge our company is, but my internet connection yes. is not uh, cutting edge. Rick, is, <laughs> Rick, Rick happens to be in a bad place today in the middle of nowhere, uh, Pennsylvania. No offense to people that live in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. It's just you don't have the best internet access out there sometimes. Really excited, though, to have all of you uh, you're listening and watching. We're starting to build our audience over there, which is kind of exciting. Now, Rick, you were explaining a little bit about what you do over there. Um, tell us a little bit about um, you know, how you got involved in this particular business and why you love doing research and gaining insight to help people like hoteliers be more successful in what they're doing. Well, thank you for uh, the opportunity. I've been doing this work now for uh, longer than I like to admit. Right. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> I think I was doing it back when... Fred and Barney were students, but uh, what I'm going to say is that... Uh, Sadly well, enough, I, a lot of the younger people listening might not even get that reference. Yeah, I, I know. Well, <laughs> if they understand Flintstones vitamins, they might. Yes. But right. anyway, what, what I was going to hey, say... 10 million is, strong and growing, kind of like our audience here today, Rick. Very much. So what I was going to say is that I was doing this research in hotels back in the day. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's a hotelier can relate to this. Right. Uh, Back in the day when we were doing paper reports, uh, where we drop off quarterly reports for guest right. satisfaction, and mm -hmm. I was working with all the major chains, and obviously over the years, technology has just really changed our industry a lot, right. and uh, really revolutionized how we get our insights, how we think about uh, the work we do, the immediacy and the urgency to get feedback very quickly. Right. We're in a, we're in a world where things are rapidly evolving, and I like to think that uh, you know, I'm learning as well as the people that I work with. Absolutely. This is really what, what brings us to this moment where we're talking today. Yes, and we are talking today. And what we're looking forward to is having you folks out there participate as well. Because, hey, you know, I think I know a lot of stuff. Rick definitely knows a lot of stuff. But I really want to know what you folks know out there, in particular, how you're thinking about differentiating your hotel product, how you're thinking about being um, the one in your market that people recognize is something different, a leader in that business. And it's really important because we want to kind of crowdsource some great ideas so we can empower all of you hotel out there to be more successful. So I think the first question that we really need to get to is how can you differentiate yourself in a crowded market? And I'd like to encourage everybody out there to, to give us your thoughts, your ideas. We'll bring you in the conversation as the best that we can and realize that right now I am going ahead and I am trying to uh, manage 
this uh, talking to you guys while also managing the conversation. So if I'm not looking right at the camera, please be patient for me. And he's back. So, All right, Rick, tell us a little so, bit about uh, tell us a little bit about um, how you can differentiate your hotel product. So so let's talk about sort of a little history. So at one time in ancient history, some hotel brought in a television for the first time. Right. It was a huge deal, I'm sure, at the time. And then somebody brought in a phone and all these things that after a while became pretty much a uh, mm -hmm. entry. And right. then the world continued to evolve and more things took place. And what at one time were differentiators were, were no longer differentiators. They were essentially the cost of doing business. So in the last uh, several years, we've seen a lot of evolution in the industry. So, for example, giving free breakfast at mid-scale hotels. Mm -hmm. That whenever um, people started doing that, it might have been a stale roll and a box of cereal. Now it's a nice hot breakfast, right. free right. internet access, mm -hmm. a much better enhanced bed experience, an enhanced shower experience. All these things were intended to be, at the time, differentiators, and they were. But after a while, whenever somebody comes in with some new idea, somebody else comes in, emulates it. And after a while, it becomes pretty much standard operating procedure. Right. We're always then looking for what's the next thing that's going to differentiate our hotel from our competitor. Uh, it'll be a while, and then that competitor will catch up, and then we'll have to find something else, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so really, where are we today? Well, as I see it, the, the next big cutting edge to differentiate is based around the whole area of technology. Mm -hmm. so it's been interesting as we've watched, I've, and again, I've worked with all the major chains at one time or another, watching the various chains as they experiment with different types of technology that they think would be of benefit to their guests. And again, I, I know a lot of these hotels very well. I know they do market research and uh, they do a lot of uh, investigation as far right. as what their guests want. Some of these ideas work, some of them don't. Uh, so, for example, I, I won't necessarily name names, but there was an uh, upscale chain that uh, brought in self-service kiosks to check in right. uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, within a few months, people were taking those self-service kiosks out. The really? intention was to... Oh, well, we're going to have to see what he says about self-serve kiosks as soon as he rejoins the conversation. But self-serve kiosk thing is interesting to me. I remember the late 1990s when the, the kiosks were first introduced. It was a matter of technology being a little bit before its time. Um, now, in the, uh, the, the 2019 era, people seem to be um, gravitating more towards that. But, Rick, why didn't it work a couple of years ago in the instance that you're talking about? Well, as you say, sometimes it's just be, uh, it's an idea that's come before its mm -hmm. time. I'll give you another example. Right. Uh, another hotel chain that I work with very closely uh, experimented with the whole notion of Alexa for hospitality. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the voice system that many people have in their home that uh, Alexa, turn on the lights, turn on the radio. Right. That would be a great idea because someone needs more towels. Alexa, bring me some more towels. Mm -hmm. and what ended up happening is that you know people within a fairly short time asked to be moved to different rooms because it felt like an invasion of privacy. Right. In the middle of the night, middle of a conversation, Alexa speaks up and says, I didn't hear that and freaks people out. Yeah. So in, in talking with the, the chief marketing officer of this particular hotel chain, it was her view that this might have simply been an idea, as you mentioned, that came before its time. Right. Uh, in a couple of years, everybody's going to have these voice activated systems in their home. They're going to be completely used to them. And this technology, mm -hmm that seems scary today will be very much, you know, the norm. Same right. thing with the self-service kiosk idea that I, I came up with, uh, that I was using a, a little while ago as an example. Um, it's one of these things where today it seems like it, it lacks that person, mm -hmm. it seems like too much work, but you go into your local McDonald's and they're eliminating all their front desk workers. Right. And you use a kiosk to order your McDonald's. Uh, I suspect probably within not, too long, uh, this is gonna be the norm in fast food restaurants. And so sometimes, as you rightly point out, I don't think it's necessarily the, that the technology isn't good or helpful. I think it just simply might be before, uh, before it's, right. it might just be a little early. Right, you're, you're absolutely right. So I think the first lesson that we could learn with, uh, learn today about is sometimes it's good to be an early adopter with new things. Sometimes it's better just to take a wait and see approach and let others 
play with that particular type of uh, technology. And again, it's very dependent on what that technology is because there might be certain technologies that are going to create such a point of differentiation that you want to take that risk. Now, when it comes to the uh, the part where we're, we're talking about voice activated stuff in the room, I think the, the problem that they had is that there was no way to turn it off. People didn't feel secure. They felt their privacy was being invaded, as you said, Rick. And I think that the um, there is opportunities out there. I know a company, uh, Cirque Plus, for example, has security systems in it, so you can turn it off. You can even just pull out the little unit if you don't want, make it really easy for you. And um, society is going to get caught up to this particular thing. So we, we are talking today to, to get the uh, the listeners who are just turning in, um, tuning in about the big trends that we're seeing in hospitality and how you folks out there might be able, able to leverage opportunity through great new technologies. I'd very much like to hear what you guys have to say. Um, Frederick uh, Schoner, for example, he's a uh, hospitality consultant, says automation is indeed the future. And he just stayed at the Hillsborough Embassy Suites and never had to go to the front desk and absolutely loved it. It may be early, but it was so much nicer than dealing with the desk. Now, that's interesting to me, Rick, and brings up a brings up a point that I think we have to be considerate about with all of technology. And uh, Rick will be back in a second, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that point. But when it comes to uh, technology out there, I think what we have to figure out is uh, how to create some other different touch points that are out there. So, Rick, I was saying that um, with technology, um, and in this case, the kiosk, you're going to lose a valuable touch point and you need to figure out how to keep emotionally connected to your guests as much as possible, right? So how do you see technology helping or hindering the way that we connect as guests with guests as hoteliers? Well, the point you're raising is a great one. So when I was at my previous firm, we did a lot mm -hmm. of work with looking at customer experience and what right. really right. drives guest engagement loyalty. And one of the interesting things we found was that the more different types of people a guest engages with during the course of a stay, mm -hmm. the more satisfied and loyal they are and likely right. to return. Right. So there's right. that human contact, the hospitality piece that really is important. And the front desk is uh, the one place that many people have to interact with the hotel. Mm -hmm. Having said that, some of the other research I've done shows that people like interaction as long as it doesn't get in their way. Mm -hmm. For example, we find similar sorts of results when we're dealing with rental car companies, that people really enjoy interaction with rental car employees as long as they don't impede them or slow them down right. if they're trying to get out and be on their way Right. Same with hotels. So the folks that wrote in there <clears throat> probably enjoyed the fact that they didn't have to talk to anybody. Maybe they were tired it was late at night. They didn't really want that interaction, and so they liked the idea that the technology gave them a way to avoid that. Right, which is great because I know me, I'm uncomfortable around people, so it's great to be able to avoid them all the time, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, again, for me, I like people. Right. I like talking to people, yeah. but if I'm tired or if I'm in a right. hurry, I like the idea of being able to get on my way. So, mm -hmm. again, really where this technology is, is again, helpful and good is that if it expedites someone's customer journey, then that's great. Now, again, what happens is in some cases, for example, Keyless entry has been tried, where mm -hmm. try to you know download keys on smartphones and yep. try that technology. And the difficulty is that sometimes the technology doesn't work. It's still in development. Right. You your room, you try your smartphone, the key doesn't work. Now you've got to go back to the front. Yeah, and uh, you know, he's, Rick is absolutely right when you have to go back to your front desk, and that's why when I'm um, in a resorts, particularly large resorts, I'm going to keep that plastic key card on me at all times because if I got the plastic key card on me, I know that I'm going to have that sense of uh, safety and uh, security, right? Um, so, uh, uh, Rick, so we were, um, you know, uh, to, to, to bring you up to, up to speed, we're just talking a little bit about how I, too, feel a little bit uncomfortable with that particular type of technology sometimes. Well, and, and think about this. Think about mm -hmm. the you ever deposited your paycheck into an ATM. Right. Remember that. that was the scariest thing I can think of. <laughs> uh, scariest thing I can think of is depositing the check and having it bounce. <laughs> well, assuming that that doesn't happen, right? Yeah. Uh, I've, worked know, for, I've worked for companies before. If they give you a check, you go running to the bank right away to hope that it cashes. <laughs> so, so that's a different issue. But in yeah. terms of the technology, <laughs> putting the check into the ATM, mm -hmm. trusting that your check's not going to be eaten up Mm -hmm. and you're not going to lose your entire paycheck. Right. 
But now, you know, we do this very routinely. Uh, right. Putting money in an ATM, not scary at all. So really, it's, it's, a, it's a matter, again, of getting used to it. Uh, I'll, I'll give you another example. I went over to Dubai uh, a couple of years ago, and all the, uh, the lights of the room, the drapes, everything was all connected to an iPad system. So I, I had so much trouble trying to figure out the iPad and how to get it to work that I actually ended up falling asleep with the lights. Right. right. And, uh, <laughs> when, we, when we looked at the, the guest complaints or <laughs> struggles with the technology was right. among right. The, uh, the most frequent guest complaints, right? So it's a situation where sometimes the very things that are intended to be, you know, to reduce friction actually right. increase friction in the customer journey. That's right. And uh, that's an interesting point that you make out there. And I've always joked around that I don't think hotel rooms should come with an instruction manual on how to use them. Um, but we do have to find a way to uh, create technologies that are intuitive, easy to use. And that's why I like um, the, uh, the systems where you can text in something and AI kind of helps um, drive answers or provides you a human being behind it in order to be able to uh, facilitate whatever need you have. But I got an interesting question here from uh, from Andrew. And he's wondering what career paths are gonna look like for operational leaders if they don't gain front desk experience because they were replaced with kiosks. I, I think that's a an interesting issue. To me, I think it's a matter of getting people out from behind the desk and interacting with the other human beings that are staying with your property to help create those relationships and give those uh, those front level people an opportunity to grow and learn and mature in their job, their job titles. Yeah. I, I love Andrew's question because it's mm -hmm. another example of how right. technology is changing workplace roles. Right. And uh, so uh, again, one of the, the challenges and, and I think that this answers Andrew's question mm -hmm. for somebody who's rising in the hospitality field is thinking about how to continue to give that hospitality. Right. Uh, along with supplemented by the technology so that the technology doesn't replace people, but it complements the work that they do. And you still don't lose the hospitality because people don't become loyal or engaged or emotionally connected to buildings for the most part. Right. They get connected to the people that they interact with, the whole vibe of the hotel, yes. the, the, the service piece. And there's a lot of good neuroscience work out there that shows that human interaction is really what ignites people's brains in a positive way. Yeah, it, it really is. And it's so much more satisfying than um, being surrounded by technology all of the time. I just saw a, uh, a political cartoon um, that showed uh, a family celebrating Thanksgiving in 1999 versus a family that's celebrating Thanksgiving in 2019. In 1999, they're all around the table communicating with each other, having a great time. And the 2019 picture was everybody on their cell phones all alone and uh, being individual, being individual. So that's kind of depressing if you think about, um, you know, how technology has a tendency to separate us, Rick, instead of bringing us closer together, even though you'd think it would have brought us closer together. And hoteliers need to kind of think about that as well. And I, I always wonder why we don't think about how we use technology in our personal lives when we think about how we're gonna utilize technology to service our guests in the hotel business. Well, I, I was going to say there are certain mm -hmm. people, and, and again, I think right. there are millennials who would probably admit to being in this category. There are people who would just as soon not interact with anybody. Right. Um, you know, I mean, there are people who would just as soon use their smartphones and avoid people. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, the old joke is that people will sit across the table from each other texting one another rather than talking. Right. And, I've, uh, been, I've been there. It's not a joke. It's real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that is a new dynamic, right? Yeah, right. So we, we have to, we have to account for that, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, again, the fact that millennials continue to make up a greater and greater uh, part portion of our traveling public, and now with the Gen Z group coming of age, uh, yep. you know, Gen Xers and Boomers will be eventually sort of out of the picture, and this adaptation to all the technology that we're discussing is going to evolve pretty naturally, I think. Right. The time being, there's still this growing pain. Um, I'll tell you, I was just at uh, the Expedia conference uh, a week ago, and I heard Colin Powell talking mm -hmm. about the struggles he has with the alarm clock in his hotel room. Right. And, uh, yeah. General Colin Powell can't get his alarm clock to work. And I, I oftentimes find myself the, the same way. I feel like I need a PhD 
and alarms to get the, the clock. Oh, open. oh, Rick, why, why would anyone think we could get the alarm clock to work? They can't even get the time to be correct in ninety percent of the hotel rooms on that. <laughs> So that's just a lost cause as far as I'm concerned when it comes to the alarm clock. Now, I know I got some good friends over at a nonstop out there that do a great um, like wireless charging thing with the alarm. And I got to guess that they probably set the uh, the time on those alarms automatically so we don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, but I want everybody to know that's watching. So we're live. But when Rick and I are talking, we're about 20 seconds behind what you say what you see out there. So if you put in some comments, it's gonna take us a little bit of time in order to get to your comments and uh, to share them and then get back to you. So there'll be a little bit of a delay there, but I really do appreciate you guys uh, participating in this. All right, so Rick, back to the questions at hand. What do you think we're gonna be, what do you think is gonna be some of the next technologies that hoteliers are gonna to start to think about and playing with beyond uh, voice activated rooms and kiosks and that sort of stuff? Well, I think. All right, so I guess we're going to have to wait for Rick to come back to find out what he has to say. The suspense is going to be killing me until he returns. But until there, I'd love for you guys to follow us here on uh, LinkedIn. Just, uh, you know, follow us over there. It's pretty easy. And uh, and he's back. All right, answer your question, yeah. sir. So I think the, the first one is make, making sure that there's always reliable wireless Internet. Uh, if only you were in a hotel today, it wouldn't have yeah, been a problem. Yeah, I was. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, all joking aside, that is something that, uh, continues to be a struggle for all hoteliers, and if there are any on the on the podcast, they can certainly attest right. to the fact that bandwidth is is always a challenge. Right. But moving beyond that, I think you know again, keyless entry is going to be what what people are really going to focus mm -hmm. and and are focused right. on right now. That's one. I, I spoke to a group of the top fifty hotel CIOs uh, a couple of years ago, and we were going through all the various technologies and kind of having people raise their hand of this is something that they think is going to stick or something that's not going to stick. And the one thing that everybody agreed on is really right. making, finding some way to get people in their rooms past the front desk uh, using their technology. Geofencing is another one where if I'm walking by the bar, something pops up on my, my phone offering me a, a special two for one drink coupon. Love that. Or welcoming me to the hotel. When I step in the door, uh, I get an email that that's, that's another one that people are working on pretty fast and furiously. Right. Uh, beyond beyond some of those things that you know, again, I, I think are are really being implemented at a pretty quick rate right now. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of other things that people are looking at. You know, things like whenever you get out of the bed, walking to the bathroom, and your floor lights up. I love that. That's a great technology. I saw that back at the former Peabody Orlando going on ten years ago, and I thought it was the most amazing thing. And now that I'm a guy of a certain age, I really appreciate the light in the floor in the middle of the night. Yeah, I've only experienced it a couple of times. So to me, it seems like a relatively new, uh, new innovation. But you It know, is. It's one of those innovations that were a point of differentiation, but are starting to work themselves down from the luxury upscale levels to uh, to the more mainstream hospitality business. Now, Rick, we got a, we got a comment. Um, oh, we're going to have to wait to read the comment to uh, to Rick until he gets back. But again, I want to thank you all for tuning in and dealing with some of our technology issues. In fact, thanks for tuning in. Share this link with a friend. So, Rick, I got to say, uh, uh, a listener, Paul, is saying there's a huge deficiency of knowledge in what automation exists and how to access or use it. And he understands that Marriott's been beta testing Alexa like we've been talking about with another brand. But uh, as a guest, he wasn't sure what the functionality it actually afforded the person. So that's another challenge. Why have this thing in the room if people aren't even going to understand what the purpose of it is and how it's going to accentuate their experience on the property level? Well, you know, again, great points that people are yeah, making. And, right? And one of the things I'd say is that, you know, I, I've noticed, and again, this is me being an old guy sounding right. old. I noticed, for example, that, that people have such intuitiveness about technology these days. Right. When you see kids get on gaming systems. It, it feels like they, they automatically know what to do. I am not of a mindset that I'm, I'm that way. I mean, I'm like the person who typed it in and say, I need instructions. I need guidance. I need all those things. And that's another place I think where hotels can right. use the friction for their guests is if you're going to put new things and new features in the rooms, let people know about them. Let people know how they work and what their purpose is. But don't make it too nice complicated. Right. Yeah. What, what good is it having something like that if uh, people really don't know how to access and 
take advantage of it. Right. Absolutely. So this is, I think, a good point in the conversation to uh, do my little stump speech on digital immigrants versus digital natives. Right. The whole notion of uh, digital immigrants are older folks like myself and Rick, folks that weren't. Um, born with an iPad in their hands, folks that existed before the internet. We have to learn all of these technologies. We have to adapt to it. It's the reason why my parents um, left that VCR, if you guys know what that is, blinking 12 o'clock all the time, because it was a technology that they had to adapt to. Whereas digital natives are younger folks, think younger millennials, think Generation Z. Those younger folks were are digital natives because they were born with that te technology. And for some reason, inherently, it's easier for them to learn. Maybe it's because when we're younger, we're like sponges and we pick up all of this information quickly, easily, simply, or maybe it's something else mystical going on in the universe. But whatever it is, younger people seem to understand the technology of the day much better than older folks. Yeah, you know, I honestly think, and, and there's some neuroscience to back this up. Yep people's brain wiring is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that this is actually an example of how people's brains are evolving uh, with the times. And, right. um, you know, again, I just see an, an adaptability for kids and technology that, uh, you know, they often say, you want to figure out your phone, go ask an eighth grader it can help you. Right. There, there's something there. There's something to that. So, yeah. There absolutely is. So uh, let me throw it out to you guys out there. I'd love for a little bit more participation. What type of technologies would you like to see in hotels? Or conversely, what technology have you come in contact with that you're either offended by or just don't understand or find uh, completely useless? I'd like to simplify the technology for a second and just get somebody to do something right where I can get the two shades in my window to overlap each other and close so there's not a giant stream of light shining through the middle of the room. Something simple, something easy. That's what I'm looking for, Rick. Yeah, and I, I think, again, you know, sometimes people think that newer and slicker is better, always, automatically. And most of the time, newer and slicker is better, but not right. always. So, for example, I don't know about those iPads that uh, I found in those rooms at Dubai. I don't know if they really help my life at all, or help anybody's life from compared to just simply opening the drapes or turning on the heating and cooling system and yep. doing things without necessarily having to go to an iPad to do it. Yep. Uh, there's a study that recently came out uh, that I read where uh, robot butlers are something that are being tested in hotels. Yep. I, I read in this study that, that people really don't like interacting with robot butlers. Now I've never seen one, uh, but you know, sometimes I think in these cases, and again, this is, this is me talking here and giving my opinions. I think some of these are intended to replace human beings in their jobs. They are. And necessarily make things more efficient. And, you know, every time, like, for example, I go into McDonald's and I go in the kiosk, I think, how many workers have just lost their jobs? Right. Their first uh, opportunity to work at a fast food restaurant. So understanding that it's about technology and development and automation and all those things, but... Do they really make people's lives easier or are they just an excuse to get rid of people? I, I think it's a, I think it's, a, it's a little of both, in my opinion, Rick. Some of it is to streamline things. Some of it might even be to accentuate that customer service. And while we wait for Rick, um, I have seen um, those robots in hotels. And I think that they have a very practical application in them. Um, so, Rick, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about how I, I've seen the robots in the hotels. And I got to tell you, if um, a robot was going to bring me something to my room at 6, 7 in the morning when I don't want to face a human being, that's fine by me. I feel uncomfortable with the room service guy sometimes coming into my room. It might be fine yeah. to have the robot deliver it. If I need the extra towel, might be fine to have the, uh, the robot deliver it. And I'm thinking, operationally speaking, at that select service hotel, you may only have one or two people working the overnight, right? And if I need something at two in the morning, how cool is it for that back office person to get to stay downstairs and service that late traveler coming in off of a, of a flight and setting up the robot to give me a towel? So it's not all a question of uh, saving jobs versus not having those uh, those jobs. There is a little bit of nuance here that we need to consider as well that I think, but it's really super interesting to see how all of this stuff is kind of going, right? Yeah, fair enough. And uh, again, there's a, there's a certain person out there, a certain traveler that, that probably loves all of this technology. Right. Others who, who find it a bit uh, disconcerting and maybe a little off-putting, not all that helpful. Right. But in time, 
uh, my point that I hope I'm, I'm making successfully mm -hmm. in time, you're going to have a Absolutely. situation where everybody is familiar and as comfortable with technology as they are in depositing their paycheck in an ATM machine. Uh, you got that right. Think again, back to the early days of the internet when people were afraid to put their credit card numbers into the machine. Yeah. Now we realize it's safer to do that online than it is to hand a credit card to a server in a, uh, in, in a restaurant. Now, Linda, Linda Bill, um, the VP of sales with Clean, uh, Clean Brand says, iPads and rooms just complicate things all for technology if it actually makes things easier and more efficient. And Rick, this is where I think the whole notion of, uh, you know, you have BYOB, bring your own beer sometimes. What about bring your own tea, bring your own technology with you. If I could connect to the app for the hotel brand on my iPad and it opens up the opportunities to control my room, to control that television within the room and all of these different things, I think I'd feel more comfortable using my own piece of equipment as opposed to bringing somebody else's. And the side benefit of that is the hotel doesn't have to outlay all that extra cost for those iPads or for those other connectivity devices. Yeah, and I think again, this, this all comes down to individual preference, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, if you've flown in an airline recently. No, unfortunately. They were starting to put a lot of uh, seatback entertainment in. Right. Now they've taken them out, and now it's like bring your own device. Mm -hmm. Many people prefer that. You know, like for me, I like the convenience of not always having to bring my iPad in a plane. But you know, for other people, they prefer it. Right. Uh, again, I just want to say one size doesn't fit all here. And um, you know, I, again, I, I'm sure that there are people who just love all of this. And uh, I want to say that, and I. Again, I think really what it comes down to is for a hotel to understand its clientele, understand timing like we were talking about at the onset of this podcast, and uh, you know when's the right time to innovate given your hotel audience and who your customer base is. And right. you know, the other thing I'll say, and, and you had talked about this at an earlier point, you know, the value of being an innovator. So if you're the first person on your block and you bring in an innovation, Mm -hmm. benefits. Now you're offering something that other people don't. You've differentiated yourself and some of the work I've done shows that you can actually charge a premium for that. Right. And we're going to have to wait another few seconds until he gets back. Dang you, internet. You're killing me. In the meantime, let me shamelessly plug the No Vacancy with Glenn Hausman podcast. Uh, that's me. Find so, the No so Vacancy podcast wherever you want online. Rick, back to you. Okay, so, so that's great. You know, whatever... You know, you come in and you can realize that premium. But, of course, then you run the risk of being one of those early innovators and the innovation doesn't necessarily catch or it's too early. Right. Uh, I, I, I've done a lot of work in this area where I've seen ideas that were implemented and they didn't work. And then later on, they, they proved that they were great ideas that just had really uh, come a bit too early. So, you know, there's a value in that if you're an early adopter, an early innovator, you get the uh, the benefit of the, being able to charge the premium for something different. Now, it's sort of if you, you're you the first on your block and you you do that, you're the beneficiary. Now, if you right. decide to wait, what happens is you still might have to make the investment, but now you're just met, you're investing to catch up. You're not necessarily realizing the premium of being a, an early adopter or an innovator. Interesting. And I want to get to uh, some more of the comments we have here, but I'm curious, Rick, um, how do you go about figuring out if you're going to be like um, uh, 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 Goldilocks, right? Is it uh, is the technology going to be too early, too late, or just right? Well, you're asking the right person. because I, <laughs> and, I, good. and I would say the answer to that is good market research, right? Is that researching and understanding your customers. Right. Like I said, I've worked in this business a long time, and uh, and I always respect the people I work with. But there are people who say, well, I know my customers, and I know what they want. And then there are people who say, you know, I think I know my customers, but right. I really want to I want to research and and do a little bit of market study here. Mm -hmm. to understand is are, are the things that I'm thinking about doing really what my customers want? And I think right. the group always ends up a little a little bit better off. Yeah. All right. So you you say what customers want. How do you differentiate differentiate between what they say they want and what they really need? Um, again, good question. You know, so there's different categories of things, right? You know, there are things that you know we we don't think we want, but then we show up and 
when they're there, we really like them. You know, those right. are called delighters. Yep. And, uh, whenever you can find a delighter, that's always something. I didn't expect it, but you gave it to me, and I'm really happy. Versus things that I come in and I expect, and they're not there. Right. Uh, again, that's something that uh, you know research can tell us. Uh, sometimes people say, "Oh, I don't care about A, B, or C," and then you find out when you do a study that the presence of a particular feature or benefit or amenity is something that's highly correlated. Mm -hmm. with satisfaction it's something they really like right so again you know it, it's not all science there's a certain art to it but uh if you if you really study and understand your customers you make the right decision more often than not i i feel like it's time to invoke malcolm gladwell's book blink and the whole notion of uh trusting your gut I find in my life, anytime I haven't trusted my gut when it comes to decisions like this, I'm 95% of the, the time I probably screwed up by not trusting my gut because we have this whole lifetime of experience and our bodies process it in a subconscious way that kind of gives us the yes or no gut feeling on whether or not to do something. So I do encourage everybody out there to trust your instincts a little bit more when you're thinking about what it is that your customers truly need as opposed to what they claim that they want. So Rick, I gotta, gotta throw it back to you and, and ask you, um, what are you thinking about in terms of the, the future? Where is all of this going for technology? How can we make sure that we incorporate the right technologies at the right time that enhance customer service, create that emotional connections with the staff and help create that loyalty. So it goes back then to understanding sort of who your customer is. And, you know, there's a lot of lifestyle branding that's taking right. place right now in the, the marketplace. And there are hotels that are deliberately targeted for Hello. younger millennial customers. Uh, right. You know, some of them, we know what they are. And I've been to some of them. I walk in, I say, well, that's not necessarily for me, but I mm -hmm. love I love the fact that you're trying to resonate with your core customer. Right. And uh, those customers that are designed for younger travelers, absolutely 100% go full stop yeah. trying the new technologies. Right. I now have uh, cats that are trying to be part of the uh, the podcast. So uh, say hello to the cat. We'll try to get rid of that. I'm um, sorry for the shaking there because of the animal. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, other, I would say the older hotels that might appeal to the older business traveler who may not be right these innovations, maybe in those cases, you, you hold off a little bit more. It's all about understanding your customer. Now, when it really comes down to what are the differences between millennials right. and everyone else, I find that uh, sometimes a lot of these differences are a bit overstated. One thing that cannot be overstated, however, is that Millennials are far more tech savvy than any other generation. So I'm definitely more tech savvy than my mom. I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that. I mean, we—that's one thing that whatever <laughs> about millennials that may be true or false or right. inaccurate, they are absolutely more tech savvy and more tech reliant. So right. In either case, if your your target is a millennial audience, then be an early adopter, be an innovator. If uh, smart target customer and you know you still are getting a lot of the uh, older gen x or baby boomer guests maybe in that case be a little slower to adopt the new technology or if you adopt it you know make sure that you do what someone was suggesting earlier make sure that people understand how to use it and, and how to take advantage of it so it's not something that is uh, more of a source of friction than a reducer of friction in the guest experience. Right. I think that that sums everything up absolutely perfectly and eloquently. I don't think I could, uh, I could even top that one. So I think it's a perfect time to uh, wrap it up unless you have any other points that you want to make out there, Rick. No, I, I think it's been a great discussion and uh, you know, we certainly love if you get any further feedback or anybody wants to write me at our garlic, uh, G A R L I C K at maggot M A G I D.com with any more ideas and suggestions. We love to hear about this because we're really a company that again, stays ahead of the trends. And when we when we go in to work with our clients and customers, we try not to cover the ground that's already been covered, but we're always trying to be innovative. And one place he's not innovative is uh, being able to deal with this technology issue that he is uh, having. So hopefully he'll come back in one second, but uh, I do up uh, and he is back right now. Boom. Yeah, I just wanted to have, 
one more tech failure before I ended up just saying yeah. and for and thank you to your audience for this discussion. I apologize for the uh, occasional drops in the internet, but uh, you covered it well and uh, really enjoyed being with you today. Thanks, and I uh, I enjoyed having you here today. And uh, you never know what's going to happen on LinkedIn Live. We got we got dropouts. We've got animals, uh, you know, chasing us down. We got all sorts of issues. But I had a lot of fun, and I really appreciate all of you tuning in for another episode of No Vacancy uh, Live here on LinkedIn. Uh, next week, I'm going to be in Las Vegas at the uh, Red Lion Conference. I'm going to be hosting their general session. Congrats to uh, John Russell, industry icon, who is now their interim uh, CEO. Um, I'm going to be there. Come and say hello. I don't know whether or not next week I'll be able to uh, knock out one of these sessions, but um, me and Anthony Mercury are both going to be in uh, Vegas. Maybe we'll pop on. Maybe we won't. Love for you guys to check out uh, Rick Garlic and uh, Maggot. And in the meantime, I want to thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. Another great episode of No Vacancy Live on LinkedIn. See you all next thank time. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, we're clear.